Please join me in welcoming the filmmakers to the stage. Everyone here, please come on up. Uh, please welcome them as they come up. Stage, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Don't be shy. All right. <laughs> Nobody on the end has a mic. Somebody on the end needs to have a mic so we can start. Introduce yourself and your and your project. Um, well, you can introduce yourself. Okay. Hi, everyone. My na my name is Maddie. I am here supporting Abortion Hotline. This is Lisa. I did not make a film. I'm here with the New York Abortion Access Fund. Thank you, Maddie. <laughs> I'm Mike Addy, and I'm part of the uh, Abortion Helpline film. Part of that team. I'll just finish. I'm Janet Goldwater, Abortion Helpline. Oliver. I'm Oliver. Uh, I'm here with Mason. <laughs> Hi, my name's uh, Nathan Reich, and I directed The Warming Shed. <laughs> hey, I'm Adam Forrester. I've co-directed Some Million Miles. Welcome, everybody. So please share with the audience how you came to your subjects. Oh. So uh, my co-director and I, we went up there, and this is in Sand Mountain in Alabama, and he had been working with subjects up there, photographing people on, it's called Meth Mountain, uh, since 2015, and he was like, let's go up there in 2017 and do some video work, and... Uh, and then we pitched that video and got a grant and went back and, and made this film. So. Um, so I had uh, originally actually wanted to do a film about a town that was nearby the family um, called Marmoth, North Dakota. And uh, as I was working on the film about the town, sort of this macro view of the area, um, I wanted to include cattle ranching because it's the second biggest industry in that area. And I, when I met the family, it was just sort of this slow, gradual um, unfolding relationship. First it was the cows, then I met the parents, then I realized there was like 12 kids on the farm, and <laughs> I just kind of started to hang out with them and get to know them, and it, it was um, sort of a following my intuition, um, and that was kind of how it took off. Um, so I live in Philadelphia um, and have been a long time. Um, a reproductive justice advocate, and and um, and along with my um, work partner, we've made a couple of feature films about abortion-related issues, both um, international and national. Um, so those were features. Um, when 2016 hit, we decided that um, that this was a subject we wanted to like work quickly to um, show, cast the light on this this particular aspect of of um, inequ inequities within abortion. Um, I actually went to Florida to shoot a music video, and um, somehow I wound up at a midnight drag racing event, and I saw the little kid Mason and his grandparents and the grandpa um, was like smoking weed in front of the kid, and I was <laughs> just like, <laughs> wow, this is um, new to me. And then as I sort of got to know them and understand them, I realized that I wanted to make a short film. Uh, I'm having no, do you, okay. Janet covered me. Yeah, no, well. I figured, I figured. Uh, so you all uh, chose to use the uh, format of, of observational, right? Uh, it, it, it's a particularly strong grammar, I think, in documentary in that you drop the audience into the world of your subjects. Uh, talk about why you felt that was the, the best approach for the story that you were telling. Okay. All right, I'll start. Uh, I think to me, um, when I you know, first um, like witnessed one of these calls and, and heard, heard it, there was no other way to get across the um, immediacy of the challenge that these women were dealing with. I think when you, when you hear what they're saying and hear the desperation, but also for me it was just hearing that along with seeing those numbers and seeing how uh, sometimes you're talking about like $25 and hearing uh, the tenor of their voice during all of that too. I just don't think that there was any other way to do that, and um, 
for me, it really felt like it, it contrasted well or it played off well with the archival film where you see these people who are discussing this issue on a macro level and, and in some ways feel like quite out of touch with it. Yeah, sort of treating them with respect and also I, I kind of I felt like once I met them and once I got to know them and speak to them, I felt like I had this responsibility to portray them the way that they were um, and to not sort of like insert my, as much as I could not insert my own sort of um, context into theirs and to let their own world speak for itself um, so that it could just be truthful to them. I think, uh, I just, I guess I get excited about making films that have a certain like sensory incompleteness to them and uh, um, trying to see if there can be a way of watching films that uh, kind of engages the viewer to watch with like a certain um, attention to detail and delicateness, um, which sometimes can be uh, challenging to pull off, but I think can be rewarding in its own way. So that was kind of why I went that way. So myself and co-director Jared were both photographers. That's kind of how I came to the medium of film. And so it kind of an easy segue into moving pictures, but just they're just longer than the still frame, right? So um, that that kind of aesthetic led us to make this film. And then there were these moments where we felt like the place itself became a character and we wanted to, that to sort of wash over the audience. And in particular, the last scene with Chico felt sad and, and felt like it needed, it was really awkward to just sit there and watch that and I wanted the audience to kind of feel the same way, so. You guys accomplished it. Uh, I'm gonna open it up to questions from uh, the audience for any of our filmmakers, just shoot up your hand. Yes. How did you start? How does the conversation start to approach someone about filming their life? I, I find it to be kind of terrifying because, <laughs> uh, you know, rejection sucks, but also it's something, you know, it's, yeah, it's kind of a, it's, that's to me is one of the hardest parts of the filmmaking process is, um, not just getting their trust, but also like feeling like you have a genuine connection with what you're filming. So where it's not just them that feels comfortable, but I actually feel comfortable too and being a part of those more intimate moments. Um, but I think it just, you just kind of stick your neck out there and make yourself vulnerable. And I think the connections that are meant to happen, happen. Yeah, that's my take. I find honesty works really well here. Uh, and I think that, that filmmakers are often trying to be cagey about what their films are gonna be. But more often than that, I've found I've had success in getting access just by virtue of like saying this is what I'm interested in doing, uh, you know, not really trying to be, um, for especially maybe for the films that, that I do or that we do, it's I don't think that, that you it really serves you to try to sort of like withhold information from them as well. Um, but also kind of bearing in mind that there's this like curiosity and that I couldn't really say like, oh, this is exactly what I want to do because I didn't know. Um, I really was just interested in them. And so, and making them also feel like it was, and it really was a small project, like especially at the beginning, shooting with a really small camera. They, I, I, don't, I didn't know that it was gonna be here. Um, so kind of making them feel like it was a small project, which it was, and it, and it is. I mean, it's dope that it's here too, but. Uh, <laughs> um, and then eventually it grows and grows and the uh, trust levels grow and then it can be anything and they trust me for as a filmmaker and as a person. Yeah, I would just second everything. Just this idea of building a relationship. Oftentimes, I, when I first meet a subject, I don't have a camera and we'll spend a lot of time just talking about what the project is gonna be and, and that honesty comes up a lot. So yeah, it's all about relationship building. Yes, in the middle. So since you were shooting them for so long, how did you decide which scenes wound up in the final cut? I, th I think, oh. Well, I think that, that scene at the end, I just mentioned that seemed like really poignant and meaningful 
uh, for example. But then we also wanted to highlight these moments of redemption uh, and these like these kids just really came alive in front of the camera and we wanted to highlight that these two women in the film could could come out of that too and contrast that with with Chico's sort of sad trailer moment. So. Um, I was going to say, uh, well, I had two trips filming and in the first trip when I came back with the footage, um, it was 99% uh, about the town and there was one scene that I had shot, a little bit of, of shots of the cows, but the one shot, scene with the girl and it wasn't really till I was in the edit room that I realized the best part of my footage was this one percent and um, and so it kind of changed everything once I was in the edit room and so when I went back for the second trip I really just sh shifted my focus on the family and hoped for the best that uh, the footage I would get on the second trip would be enough to make a film so yeah yeah so in the in the case of abortion helpline the um, our subjects were off camera I mean, the, count the counselors weren't really a subject, but I want to be clear that, um, that we did, when we were establishing um, you know, contact with them, they were given a very carefully worded release to, to give us permission to record those phone calls. And, and, and we were gratified that about a third of the callers um, refused, which meant that we had actually worded the release in a way that they felt p empowered to do so. Um, but that being said, we, we recorded a lot of phone calls and, um, and we got very attached to, um, to a lot of the callers because of um, the, the strength of their stories. So I think in the end, we, we, we really tried working um, you know, to, bi to build a story and to build with the, um, with the archival and the final decisions were probably made around that. Uh, <laughs> Stay with us, Oliver. <laughs> um, for me, is the whole time I was there, I kind of was conflicted about how I felt and what I was watching, and um, and so I wanted kind of the audience to also feel that sort of conflict to have each scene sort of contradict the previous one, um, so that you got to just to so that you didn't really have such a clear understanding of them as I didn't. Any other questions? Yes. That's great. I, I really appreciate it. And I and I, I want to mention that the reason Maddie's here is because we're we shot that in Pennsylvania, which has its own set of problems. Um, but you're here in New York, and Maddie um, works with the Abortion Access Fund here. Mm -hmm. so yeah. Okay, awesome. And yes, there's plenty going on here too. And I definitely agree with those sentiments. I've seen this film a few times now. And I think something that really sticks out about it is that so often when um, abortion is discussed, as it is often in the public space, um, the voices that being are being centered are not the voices of people who are actually having abortions and having worked with um, the New York Abortion Access Fund or NIAF for over three years. It is incredibly politicizing when you hear someone tell you in their own words their own story. And that's kind of what this shirt is about too. It says everyone loves someone who has an abortion. And for me, that's an incredibly grounding as well as an incredibly political statement, right? That beyond, beyond like kind of the rhetoric that's really estranged from folks lived realities that are messy, that are tied up with systems of power. Like the truth is that nearly one in three folks who can get pregnant get an abortion and we are in web and in community with um, all of those folks. And so, yes, um, we- NYAAF stands for New York Abortion Access Fund. Our name is NIAF for short, and we work closely with the folks at Women's Medical Fund in Pennsylvania. We're lucky that here in New York, unlike in PA, Medicaid does provide coverage for folks who are seeking abortion care. However, there's plenty of other barriers, and the best way to find out about them and to get in touch with us is to go to nyaaf.org, NIAF.org. Thank you, Maddie. <laughs> 
and thank you for that for that compliment. It's uh, it's really helpful. Uh, we have time for one more question. Any more in the audience? Yes, here in the front. question about the observational style of documentary filmmaking and how you determine where the story is. Do you come in with it or does it uh, reveal itself to you in the editing room? I, so Meth Mountain, for example, Jared and I went up there because he'd been going up there for four years. I'd been going up there for two years. I had a good sense of the story I wanted to tell, like we were talking about this a minute ago. And then Chico lied to us. He was like, oh no, I'm, I'm I'm not on meth anymore. And then at the end, the very last day of filming is when we got that last scene. And we left the mountain like really just troubled by it. And that's and that's when we realized like we had to shift the entire trajectory that we thought the story that we thought we were telling. And so oftentimes I feel like I go into these scenarios with an idea of how I feel like the story is going to unfold and then it changes in the editing room. As you said, that's that's how it goes a lot of times for me. Um, yeah, as I said before, um, uh, definitely all came together in the edit room, and uh, it was kind of a relief because when you're working with this kind of footage, I think uh, there's a lot of just chaos and uh, rolling with it as you go. And there was a lot of times in the beginning of shooting where every day after shooting, I would I would finish shooting and I would feel good that I shot something, but then an hour later I would go, oh my God, when am I gonna film tomorrow? Like I just had no idea what was gonna happen. And uh, that was kind of terrifying, but also really rewarding when it worked out, so. Um, damn it, I thought you were gonna go. <laughs> 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 um, something witty. <laughs> yeah, just sort of making cuz there's uh, m so the, this actually this project went to a few editors before um before I was like okay maybe I should just, just, just do this um because it, it's really delicate especially with observational cinema where you're just really watching um you can sort of t there's like a million ways I could have cut this movie to just say something totally different mm -hmm. and totally like it maybe I I could have said something manipulative that like wouldn't have been true to them but would have probably got it into more theaters. Um, and so kind of doing that balancing act, uh, or really just like staying true to them and being comfortable with the fact that they're gonna see it and, and feeling like it's, again, true to them, <laughs> but, um, but still trying to tell a story and show what I'm interested in at the time and yeah. I don't know what else to add because everything's been so well covered, but I will say that the, the editing of observational footage is just, it's like really gratifying and exciting and satisfying. It's also torture, yeah. just because of the number of choices that you have to make. And I think that that's um, a lot of that. I, I feel like a lot of it really comes alive in the editing room. You know, um, uh, you know, certainly you make choices as you go, but I think that um, it's like in that editing room, we're really kind of like seeing it all come together, watching it on the screen. It's a very different experience. So it's it's a little bit it's a little bit everything. I think in some cases you envision it, but also I think that a lot of it just becomes a response to the environment. Yeah, I mean, that's something that you certainly hear about documentary filmmaking of all sorts, be it observational or not, that really comes together in the edit. So, yeah, thank you for your question. Thank you all for joining us. That is all the time we have for the Q&A. Thank you, filmmakers, for your beautiful work. We have two more days of Doc NYC. Please come back and join us for more. <laughs>